theater as often as possible. And so at this time, we want everybody to get off of their feet and put their hands together for our guest speaker for tonight, Professor Booker T. Coleman. All right. Hotep, my brothers and sisters. I'm so very happy to be home again in a slave. And I thank you for your support. And as our brother Alton Maddox said, that if I am growing, I grow because you support me. I would like to thank my brother Alton Maddox and all of those in the United African Movement for inviting me here to be with you once again. We have some things we have to talk about this evening, as we always have, but I would at least like to begin by paying tribute to a very important man who we will be using much of his work this evening in developing concepts dealing with the comedic origin of our planet Earth. The brother we are talking about is Professor John G. Jackson. And while probably over the next couple of weeks you'll be getting a lot of information on what this brother did, I want you to understand how encyclopedic this brother was. How he could call forward, his mind was like a computer, that he could call forward information at just a request, he was brilliant. And we have so many brilliant brothers and sisters amongst us. We tend to always look to Imhotep, but we have so many Imhoteps amongst us, male and female, that we should keep very close look on because times are getting very tight now. The truth is coming forward and this curriculum is very real. This is no figment of imagination. And by far, we embarrass, or they attempt to embarrass, and insult us by saying we want ethnic cheerleading. In psychology, that's called dynamic projection. Dynamic projection is when you project your inferiority on those whom you wish to oppress. When the behavior manifests itself, it's called psychopathic. It is very important to understand what the psychopathic personality is. And no one does it better than our brother, Dr. Bobby E. Wright. Wherever I go, I always recommend, if you want to know what you're dealing with, check out Brother Wright so important for us to know and to understand. And while we do dedicate this evening's program, presentation, to our brother John G. Jackson, we would like to underpin it with words of wisdom from one of the greatest prophets to live in this century or any other, the Honorable Bob Nesta Mali. Because it is Bob Marley who teaches us to give us the teachings of the majesty because we don't want the devil's philosophy. Ride, naughty ride. You've got to wake up and live, because life is one big road, ma'at, by the way, with lots of signs, tehuti. When riding through the ruts, or kepra, don't complicate your mind. Anubis. Flee from hate, mischief, and jealousy, or the way of Setesh. Don't bury your thought, or Atum. Put your vision to a reality. Wake up and live, Nati Dread. Wake up and live. With that, my brothers and sisters, let's get busy, because we got to talk about billions of years. What I would like to do first, I'd like to give you a short synopsis of what we've done so far for those who might not have been here. We looked at the Memphite text in particular, and what we're attempting to do is we're trying to locate in our curriculum 
where we can begin to teach our children not just African history, we want to transform them into African people. There is a major difference between studying Africa and being an African. Because you can train a parrot to repeat what he learns, but it's going to take one strong parrot to be African. So it is important that we understand the difference between study and being. It is important that we reduce all concepts and all understandings so that we know what it is that our children should be learning in our classrooms. And I have to tell you, and I say this and I say this very carefully because I want to be clearly understood. When our children fail tests in school, they are really passing. And those students who pass tests fail. Because those brothers and sisters who refuse to accept information is saying something's wrong. That's some serious critical thinking. And to reject that philosophy is the way of the future. Because as we study, and we'll get into these things this evening so that you can understand what it is that we're talking about. You can't open up a planetary science book without looking at Copernicus, Galileo, and others that they will tell you they invented this and invented that. They invented nothing. And even what they stole, they got wrong. At least if you're going to steal something, get it right. It is us who will save the world. It is us who have lived in the belly of the beast who understands the means and the ways. We have to look at this curriculum and look at it very closely. We have got to be willing to be brave and to be bold and to do what is necessary. Not for education's sake, but as John Henry Clark teaches us, we must be selfish for survival. And we must not be ashamed to say we want for our people because we're the only ones that are held to the task to share. Nobody else shares. They're about themselves. And they think we're fools for sharing with them. But you see, when you find your strength, you find your weakness. And our strength, what brought humanity into civilization was our capacity to love. What destroyed civilization was the Europeans' incapability to love. It is so important that when we form our structures in our classrooms, and when we form our structures in our study groups, that we revolve around concepts, not the linear form. African people are metaphoric by nature. We don't look at something as it is. We look at something in relationship to something else to find out what it is. The only way you could know the difference between a chair and a human being is to know what both are. And then to compare, because if you look at a human, you know it's not a chair. But the only way you know it's not a chair is if you know what the chair is. That's fundamental. In our classrooms today, we are teaching human being chair, and we don't know the difference. Because we have not revolved around a concept. We revolve around a concrete item. And as Donna Marimba Riches told us the other evening, before Theofalio Benga blew our mind, she said the cornerstone to European mindset is objectification of all and everything. Never. Be the step before they put it into the department, you know, we always say that they got to put things in departments. But before you put it into the department, you got to create the department. And in creating the department, it is the objectification of information. Therefore, the European, not being part of nature or feeling not part of nature, steps out of nature and objectifies everything in it. 
African folk can't do that. We can't step out the circle because we are the circle. Europeans can step out of their life and look at themselves. African folk don't do that. And that's one of the problems in our classroom. Conceptual approach, metaphoric by nature. We speak in metaphor. We look at life in metaphor. That's bad. No, that's not bad. That's good. But I said bad so that you could understand it's so good, it's bad. That's cool. No, it's not cool. It's hot. Because everything comes from hot. But it's so cool, it's hot. Metaphoric. The same is true in subjects. And as we go through this, you will see what we're saying. Let me take you back a little bit. What I want you to walk away from this evening with is a firm understanding of what we talk about when we talk about holistic education, how to do a number of things. There are a number of ways you can look at education. You can look at it as subjects, when you go into school and you study your subjects period by period. And of course, you know where that all came from. 1909, Carnegie gets a committee together and decides he's going to find out what education is about. But the reality is that there's an industrial state coming to the United States that no longer can depend on an agricultural model. They need young people to go to school to learn to read, write, arithmetic. Don't think, read, write, arithmetic. In order to man, the, become secretaries, office managers, all these different things they needed in the turn of the century to fuel the industrial revolution in America. However, the problem is this. Everybody's on farms. Nobody going to school. And there's nobody in the future who will man these positions or human these positions when they come about. Carnegie comes together, gets a committee together, and says, let's see what we can do. Carnegie comes together, the committee presents something, and says, we believe 44 minutes is enough time you need to learn a subject every day. No educational research went into that, that, um, those words at all. Didn't study what it took to learn. They said 44 minutes is good. Why? Because from the time the sun goes up until approximately 840, we're going to let the, your children stay with you and do things on the farm. But the deal is, between 840 and 3, they must come to us to learn reading, writing, arithmetic. At 3 o'clock, we will return them to you when they can return to the fields and they can continue working with you. And as a bonus, we're going to give you July and August so you can reap what you've sown. Nobody said learning nothing. Nobody said anything about thinking. This system was set up along an agricultural model to appease the farmers and to answer the necessary things that in the Industrial Revolution that was about to happen would occur. So our children now sit in classrooms where bells go off every 45 minutes, and they think that's enough time to learn. Well, it's not, and it never will be. So what we have got to do is set up a new way of looking at things. There are five ways, they say, that you can look at the development of curriculum or what happens in a classroom. And what is a curriculum? A curriculum is a process of teaching. That's all. We hang up on the fact that we think that a curriculum is a textbook. A curriculum is not a textbook. A curriculum could be a trip to the library. It could be a trip to the store. It could be reading a poem. It could be going to a museum. It could be sitting talking to an elder. It could be a number of things. It's not just a textbook. It's not just subject-based which means you study math and you study science. But they also have a way of teaching that is called parallel. Parallel means that you take a math idea and a social studies idea and you try to parallel them to show that there's a relationship. Second way. But now there's a third way. Third way is multidisciplined. Multidiscipline says that you take many disciplines and you parallel them together. More than just parallel, which sometimes means two, you take multi, which means you take social studies and language development, and you might take some science and social studies, and you're gonna try to get something through. 
then you have the interdependent curriculum that says that you can take all of this and put it together and show how each depends on each other. And then finally, number five, and this is the African way, integrated approach. When you integrate everything and all within the subject to learn. So what we're saying is that you don't open up your science book and do science for 40 minutes. You don't then close that book and open up a math book and teach math for 40 minutes but that what you do is you construct a lesson integrated with math and science and social studies, arts and crafts, in a way that every topic is touched, but most importantly, it is integrated. I call them cultural hooks. If you went into your home or into anyone's home and you saw a coat rack, and you went to put your coat on the rack, you need a hook for the coat to stay up, otherwise it'll slide. Culture is the hook on there. So that there is something cultural that when you teach something, that something can be hooked onto that student so that they never forget it and so that coat will never fall. But now what's happening is that we have coat racks with no hooks or someone else's hooks. And I'd rather have no hooks than the hooks I'm checking out. Because you know, it is better to have no truth than confusion. Because we're gonna get into something else. Because quite frankly, let me tell you something. I've been to parts of Brooklyn and Queens, just about everywhere but Staten Island. They asked me to go out and stand now and do stab the mouths. I'm sorry, you have to come to me, Jack. I'm not going out there. And nothing would make me happier if you seceded. And let's burn that bridge after you secede. But the reality is that our children are in classrooms in totally alien situations, learning alien things with no hooks to help them. And when I look at these young people, as our brother Alton Maddox was holding up that young person, my God, brothers and sisters, our young people are ready, I'm telling you. They not half-stepping, they full-stepping. Unfortunately, some of us are doing an about-face. I mean, we not even half-stepping. We not even standing still. We doing an about-face. And I don't know about you, but when I transcend, I don't know what to tell Harriet Tubman and Fannie Lou Hamer. I, I don't know how I could tell them that things were so hard for me that I couldn't stand up and do what was necessary for our young people. Who will protect them if not us? I'm telling you they're being subjected to things that you would not believe, well you would believe because you're here. It's the people outside that wouldn't believe it. If parents understood what happened to their children from 8.40 to 3.00, if they honestly understood, I do not think they would allow that to happen. They would not allow it to happen. And one of the things that I am facing is that I don't let it happen. And you know, when I face our young people and I look at them and I know what they need and want, and then I look at how some of us are acting with them, it troubles me because you open the way for them to be attacked. And let me tell you something. You got some people that live on Long Island with a whole bunch of frustrations. They haven't the courage to take their frustrations out on who it should be taken out on. So they drive one and a half hours just to take care of our children and they ride our children's back from 8.40 until 3 o'clock. If I had my way, I would put those metal detectors. I wouldn't put metal detectors up for our young people. I'd put mental, mental for some of the people that come through just to check out what's on your mind before you come in this house. That's what we call mental detectors. 
Because if we checked out the mental detector, I guarantee you we would not need the metal detector. They can't build prisons fast enough, so they're making our schools prisons. What learning can occur when you are in a situation that is a, a constant feeling of attack? You want to put a policeman in a school? Why don't you just move the school into the precinct? Why not? Because that's what you're doing. And do you really think that one can do the job? And do you really think that's what you want in the school? We don't, but you know they do. It's important that we understand the foundations of what we say, because there is a very real curriculum out here. Looking at the works of Dr. Asa Hilliard, Naeem Akbar, Wade Nobles, Amos Wilson, using their work as fundamental psychological and using it as the principles to guide education. You then take the works of Theophilio Benga, Dr. William Leo Hansberg, John Henry Clark, Yosef Ben Yikinen, all of our great scholars, John G. Jackson, I could go down the line. Take their work and put teams of teachers together to flesh out and to develop curriculum. We will do that soon. We will do that very soon, because it's ready. And if I may, I would like to go over and discuss with you some of the ideas that we're talking about. When we came, we talked about the comedic origin of the universe. How did the universe come into being? Now, we teach this to our children all the time, so it's not like this is out of the curriculum. This is called planetary science. But there's a fundamental problem that we find in the, in the Western world that we don't find in the African world. And that problem is that in objectifying information, they took the concept of being part of the universe out. African people taught the universe. That's why we don't teach universal science. We teach planetary science, because we have no concept of what happened in the universe, according to them. But then, when you look at the works of Theophilio Benga and Sheikh Ante Diop, you begin to see that there is nothing that is being taught in the classroom that is not housed in the Memphite text. But why can't we see it? Because it's metaphoric. And if you're looking for an answer linearly amongst African folk, you're not going to get it. That's why on Sanford and Son, you remember that white policeman used to always come in? And he'd always get everything wrong. He'd say left off instead of right on. Because that was the concept. This is what has happened here. Metaphoric. I mean, sometimes, I mean, look at the handshake alone. It's metaphoric. I mean, it takes a half hour for us to shake hands sometimes. We all into turning upside down and shaking hands and smacking backs. And this is metaphoric in nature. This is psychologically set up so that we are a metaphoric people. So when we say one thing, it's being measured by something else. That's why they always, as Brother Alton Maddox clearly said, there had to be someone of European descent when three folk got together, because we get creative when we get together. And they needed someone to decipher what was being done. But let me tell you, they didn't get it right. Because if they got it right, we wouldn't be sitting here today. Because we spoke metaphorically. We sang songs, but told stories. We danced, but performed capoeira. Metaphoric. Don't look for the answer on the line. Look for it on the circle. That's where the answer is. And as we be and this is Theophilio Benga teaching us. This is Sheikh Ante Diop teaching us. We don't have to go to Europeans anymore. Budge had it wrong anyway. Many of them had it wrong because they don't think metaphorically. Yet I know rap artists that could look at the hymn to our ten written by Akhenaten and could break it down to you 
because they're looking at it metaphorically. Everybody trying to get into this old poetry thing, all these European poets and all the rest of that. Get a hold of the teachings of Ptah Hotep and Kagemni. Get a hold of the Husia by Maulana Karenga and begin to decipher for ourselves what was being said. Because when that unfolds, you begin to see a most magnificent story in most magnificent terms. Because here you have Nun, the beginnings of all and everything. Before everything and all was brought into being, the ancient Chemites said that everything resided in the waters of Nun. Unlike anything that ever existed, they taught this, they knew this. I was going to tell you this at the end, but I'm getting too excited. I had a chance to sit with our brother Theophilio Benga for approximately an hour on Monday night. Because much of the work that we're doing comes directly out of his work. And I said to him, my brother, let me ask you something. I said, Nun is the beginnings. All that occurs, everything that's here, think of it this way, electricity, magnetism, and gravity. Electricity is the spark of life. I'm talking physics to you now, brothers and sisters. Now, this went over my head when that other one told me. But when Theophilio Benga told me, I understood. Electricity is the spark of life. Magnetism, magnetism is the ability to attract or to repel. Gravity is the centering force in everything and all, that which centers you. On Earth, it happens to center us down here on Earth. Under other dimensions, it does other things. But there are three things in our universe. They broke electricity and magnetism, and they call it electromagnetism. Electricity, magnetism, and gravity. I said, Dr. Obenga, in Nun, do the ancient Chemites say all and everything is one? He said, yes. And I said, but Albert Einstein had a unified field theory that he said was the point at which everything was one. And I'm reading a book now called The Universe and Dr. Einstein. You see what Theophilio Benga does to me? Making me read astrophysics. I wasn't interested in this before. I couldn't have talked to you about this before. I had no interest in this before. But when I saw it in my own African eyes, I wanted to know more. And that's the way our children are. Show them. Let me give you an example. Have a child that's about one and a half years old, let's say 18 months. Put that young person in a room of adults. Watch that child. Then bring in another 18-month-old child. And the two will gravitate towards each other immediately. Why? Because the laws of the universe say that many times like attracts like. So when our children take the philosophy of like attracting like, which is physics, by the way, take that concept and then put it into a curriculum, and I will tell you that when children see themselves, they will want to learn. When they see Copernicus, what did it mean to me? They see Galileo, what did it mean to me? They see the Memphite text, that's what it means to me. It is important that we understand if we don't see ourselves, we turn off. And the younger we are, the quicker we'll turn off. Very important principle, and that's what's happening in our schools. I mention this to you because they said that Einstein died and never proved his theory. But the ancient Chemites had a unified field theory that they had been supporting and talking about thousands of years ago. So in fact, Einstein not only didn't invent anything new, he did not even get what he invented right because he missed the people who told him what the unified theory was. The Chemites in the waters of none. Now, if we have physicists out here, you know how heavy this is because people are still looking to prove that theory. Yet we are sitting with information in the Memphite text that already proved it. Do we need their permission? Well, then let's grab it and teach it. 
Don't you know, you don't need their permission. That has been a bluff. It's been a bluff. And as I get deeper into this information, I don't want to tell you I get scared because I don't, but I get concerned. Because I am convinced now more than ever that the most ignorant form of humanity is the European male in particular and European people in general. I say this with absolutely no malice in my heart. I just say it because we must stop following them. They have destroyed all life. Not just, I mean, people talk about what they've done to folk of African descent. But forget humanity. Forget their own women and their own mothers. Look what they did to the water. Look at what they did to the air. Look at what they did to all of the natural. You know, they couldn't have invented this information. Because if they invented this information, they wouldn't do what they do. It's like what John Henry Clark teaches us about Christianity and democracy. So two things they claim they invented wouldn't know if they tripped over it. Why? Not because of what they say necessarily. It's because of what they do. Nobody's talking about the things that they say. And the, I mean, the things that are coming out of the Native American alone, some of the things that the information coming out that's new now. Pyramids in southern Illinois. When the first founders went to St. Louis, Missouri, they called it Mound City. Because in St. Louis, Missouri alone, there are over 26 pyramids all along the Mississippi River. See, the reason why we missed the point was because the 13 colonies were on the East Coast. No one talked about the mighty, magnificent Native American civilization along the Mississippi River. We don't teach this. We don't know this. There are things that are occurring in our curriculum that are shattering the myths of yesterday. Stevie Wonder called the pastime paradise. Tomorrow is our day, and it's a most wonderful time to be African because we're not supposed to be here. By all laws of nature, what they planned, we're not supposed to be alive. And when you look at history, you can see that their plan didn't work because they hate to love us and they love to hate us because they know that we are their parents. And no matter how much, no matter how much they may try, they couldn't live past tomorrow without us. The ancients said that in the waters of Nun, there at, at one point in time that was called Kepra Septepi, the coming into being for the first time, this comes out of Jake Carruthers' work, uh, the Essays in Ancient Egyptian Studies, said that out of this there occurred a movement that brought Ptah out of the waters of Nun. Ptah is not necessarily a hill. It represented the conversion of potential energy, which is energy at rest, into kinetic energy, which is energy in motion. And in so doing began what they call the process of becoming. Out of the waters of Nun, through the energy and power of Ptah, rose Atum, rising up out of Ptah and then sitting on Ptah, Atum then began to call everything and all into being. Now what's so heavy about this? I'm about to tell you something else now. You've got four pairs of opposites or complements that remain in the waters. You've got Nun, out of Nun comes Ptah, out of Ptah rises Atum. Atum then calls everything into being. Atum is consciousness, and that's the story of where Adam and Eve came from. It wasn't Adam and Eve, that's a whole nother story. That, what was happening in the Garden of Eden was the seeking of knowledge of God. 
that the Kemites said belonged to everybody. It's a totally different story. When it came into the Western perspective, they changed the concept of attaining consciousness because look at what Adam's doing. He's becoming conscious. But Aset becomes Eve in the Western mind and becomes a negative force because in the African story of creation, it is not man and woman. It is body and soul. That's the duality brought into consciousness. But when the Western mind got it, they made it Adam and Eve. But Adam, A-D-A-M, is Atum. And what's happening to Adam in the biblical story is that he is gaining knowledge. But what did the Western civilization do? Touch anything, but don't you touch that apple tree. Because if you touch that apple tree, you shall be like me. So that's what got African folk never to study, never to read, never to get educated, always to be afraid of knowledge. And then you get into that psychosexual thing with them Europeans. You know, we're facing very serious times ahead in terms of this, this argument of homosexuality and heterosexuality. It ain't about that. It's about the European finding out sexuality. He doesn't even know why he's here. That's why he finds himself entering things he should have left alone or in the barn. When you find out what he made it with, then there's no question why we live amongst AIDS today. And when Brother Alton Maddox was talking about disease and germs, what you have to understand about in the world of color, people get sick by what enters them. Tsetse fly, mosquitoes carry germs and things like that. They infect outside in. The European is infected inside out. He is a germ. He don't carry germs. He is the germ. And the reason why he carries so many germs is because germs are parasites. And then they'll hook up with other parasites. And as Bob Marley says, this is a Babylon system. Where the vampire sucks the blood of the sufferer. These four pairs are left in the waters as frogs and snakes. I read this George G.M. James, George G.M. James's work, Stolen Legacy. I said, wow, this blew my mind. Frogs and snakes went on to say that four-fifths of the world's secrets reside amongst frogs and snakes. I said, wow, you know, we teach frogs and snakes to our children all the time. Animals, amphibians. There's a curiosity with snakes. What, what can we do with this? I studied frogs and snakes. And there's a lot more work to be done on this. But let me tell you why they were frogs and snakes. You know in biology class, you know the one we all failed? I almost failed because I refused to dissect the frog. I said, what'd that frog do to me? I said, why don't you all tape doing it to one? I mean, if you're going to do it, why do all of us have to kill a frog in here? And the frog not dead yet. You know, in biology class, you can't dissect a dead frog. It's got to be dying before you start dissecting it. It's got to be in that pail. I almost failed because I refused. I refused to cut open an animal. For what? Well, anyway, frogs are studied because they replicate the central nervous system of the human being. You dissect a frog because they best replicate how you came into being. Because in the lifespan of a frog, it begins like a human blastula or as it began in the beginnings of time in geology, something known as a protozoan, a single cell. And out of this single cell, there grows a tadpole that looks like the combination of the sperm cell and the egg. We're going to walk this through because I want you to understand. Because if we teach our children this, it is not just theory, it's application. Ancient said, if what you learn you can't use, you shouldn't have learned it at all. 
It's a waste of time. Why study something you're never going to use? I ask people, when the last time you used a squared plus b squared equals c squared, this so-called Pythagorean thing, when the last time you used it? Been a long time, hasn't it? No, it hasn't, because you couldn't have sat down without using it. When we always say, sit up straight, keep your feet flat on the ground. Ancients found out that if you sat us, that's why Imhotep is sitting. On a, that's why Aset has a throne. Because they found out that if you sit a certain way, the electromagnetic waves that are received from vibrant people like us go through your, your pineal gland this way and then have a clear uh, conduction through your body. Or should I say, well, conduction because it's uh, your body. Let's look at a water hose. You have a water hose and you bend it. Will the water come out straight? But as you begin to straighten it out, it will. The same is true with your body. When you create a 90 degree angle between your feet, when you're sitting down flat, you have a 90 degree angle where your feet end and your ankle begins. You then have a 90 degree angle, if you're doing it right, in the back of your knee. And you have a 90 degree angle in your lap. You are sitting up straight when you have 90 degree angles in all them places. And you can't sit in a 90 degree angle if your body is not in relationship to the run to rise. And the run to rise is the A equals B equals C. So when the next time someone asks you how you're going to use the Pythagorean theorem or the so-called, then you know. You could not have built the pyramids without the A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Because it was the knowledge that we gained in building and cutting bricks that allowed us to fine tune the way in which we would create the perfect pyramid out of the step pyramid because we understood that the relationship of the step period A to B would create a side C which would become the hypotenuse. So the Pythagorean theorem was in place a thousand years before Pythagoras was born. The application of it was there. Now what's the key about the application? Before you get to the application, you got to have the thousands of years of research that brings you to the concept that would make you apply it. So Imhotep not only built the step pyramid, but he had the audacity and the brilliance to lay the whole thing down. But he knew it would take time to perfect the mathematics. But he laid the whole thing down for the perfect pyramid. He's not just the founder of the step pyramid. He is the architect for the perfect pyramid. But we have to know math to be able to see this. So the frog then goes out of this form of being the combination to forming the frog and goes through the gestation period the same way we would go through it as a human being. We, it recapitulates us. Even to the point that the last two weeks it loses its tail. And that's how we knew we had tails because we just watch the frogs. This takes 16 weeks in a frog. It takes us approximately close to 10 months in a human being. And where they get this thing nine months to be pregnant? It's not nine months. I often wonder why they said that. It's a little bit more than nine months. And there's something else that replicates itself. And this is the process. But before we do that, let's look at the snake. Why would the snake be important to the Chemites to be in the water that would hold the secrets of the universe. A snake does something that's known as molting. It sheds its skin. It's up to seven times a year, but it sheds its skin. But what happens is that the snake in formation and the ancient Chemites looking at this and wanting to create an analogy said that when you look at the snake and you see that it's about to, let's say, die. The skin is dying. The skin is about to shed a film comes across the snake's eyes and it begins not to be able to see clearly anymore. It is about to move out of its old way and into a new way. And what it does is that when it gets to the point where it knows it's going, that the skin is dry and it's about to really crack open, it finds a very rough area and begins to move in a circular motion in order to cut open the bottom layer of skin, and as it moves forward, it leaves the skin behind. That was the story of resurrection. And so the frog represented the life history of the human being, and that's why it was important in the water. 
And the snake then represented that life form resurrecting itself into a new life form. And they put that uraeus right in front of its pineal gland because it knew something very important that we've lost. And this is what the Africans taught. The Africans never taught that things grow. The only thing that grows on this planet, in this universe, is consciousness. That's the only thing that moves. The reason why we are here today is not because we became what we became. The plants started a process before we were on Earth. Before the plants were on Earth, the atmosphere made it so that there was a carboniferous, just a whole area, just nothing but carbon dioxide, covered and hovered over the Earth. And out of all that rich carbon dioxide on the Earth came forward the very breathing material that the plants would need to grow. But life comes out of the thermonuclear reaction of oxygen. So when the plants began to get so great and began to get big, then it no longer had the oxygen they needed to live its life. So what happened? Let's go to the Memphite text. This is what the ancient Chemites say. This comes out of the readings, um, the evolution of Ra, the book of knowing the evolution of Ra. Nebuchadnezzar records the following story of creation. I am she, he. Now, right there, you know you're dealing with a monotheistic faith. Just by when they open up, they say I. You know they're not talking about no polytheistic. They're talking monotheistic. I am she, he. It is a she, he. Nothing comes forward from man. Nothing comes forward from man alone. Never has, never shall. I'm scared to even think about it. It goes back to this psychosexual thing. See, a lot of people talk about whether the woman, men, I should say, talk about the woman being in front of. I don't want my woman behind me. I want her beside me. I'm checking out the woman in me. I am half a woman and half a man and proud to be and not afraid to say it. And anyone that's not ain't got no mama. I'm not playing the dozens with anybody. But my mother makes me half a woman and there's a feminine side to me. That feminine side does not make me attracted to a man. It just makes me act in a most feminine way when I'm taking care of my children, that's the mother in me. When I'm doing the things that are necessary, that is the mother in me. It is neither inferior or superior. It is half of me. So Women's History Month is far more than just studying Harriet Tubman, studying Sojourner Truth. It is studying the woman in me, as women should study the man in them by the nature of your daddy. This is why Nun, the waters of Nun, are depicted as a male with breasts and pregnant. Because African folk had no problem understanding their dual nature. The law of polarity, we never had that problem. And this is something that we are facing that is very serious. I'm walking a thin line when I discuss it. Because there's a whole bunch of folk want to get on my earrings and hair anyway. But when you know who you are, it's nothing about that. And we must be honest. We must be dramatic for the 21st century. And we've got to go back to the way the Africans thought. Because to violate a woman to me would be violating me. It's not just violating our women. It's violating the woman in me. And I don't like it. If I have a problem with someone hurting a young girl, it's not just hurting a young girl, it's hurting a potential part of me. And that's how we as African folk must begin to look at the way in which the Africans spoke. They never had a problem looking at themselves. They never had a problem looking at females. When you look at Hatshepsut, you'll miss the whole point. Akhenaten used to make 
pictures of himself, depicting himself as a pregnant man. Because he understood that the gestation, the, the nourishing factor, the sustaining factor, the mother in him was what he wanted to depict not just as a man, but as a woman. And the same is true for Hatshepsut. She was not acting the part of a man. She claimed ascendancy through the throne through the same God that the men did. But no one even tells you that it was a woman that elected her. But that's to come down the road. To get back to this, I am she, he, who evolved him herself under the form of the essence Kepra. I, the evolver of the evolutions and developments which came forth from my mouth. No heaven existed and no earth, and no terrestrial animal or reptiles had come into being. I formed them out of the inert mass of watery matter. I found no place whereupon to stand. I was alone. And the essence, I call them essences. They're also called natures. The essence, shu, or air, and tefnut, water, had not gone from me. There existed none other who worked with me. I laid down everything, the foundations of all things by will, and things evolved themselves therefrom. I united myself with my shadow and set forth Shu and Tefnut out of myself. Thus, from being one essence, I became three. That is the original trinity there. It is so important to see where we get this. I became three, and Shu and Tefnut gave birth to Nut and Geb. And Nut gave birth to Usir, Aset, Setesh, Nebetet, and Heru. At one birth, it's not Adam and Eve. It's five. But those are psychological personalities that were created within the consciousness of the human being. And that is what set the human being or the hominoid from the hominid. At that point, we separated. And then we went on to consciousness. But I'm telling you this story because remember when we talked about the carbon being on the ground? This is the story. Because remember, Nut, remember Nut now, Nut and Shu and Geb. Shu finds Nut and Geb. Remember, Nut and Geb come from Shu and Tefnut. Now, Shu is air, Tefnut is moisture. Now, let's get into what we teach children today. Because there was carbon on the earth. But in order to bring forward life, air had to separate the sky or the atmosphere from the earth, and then what occurred is that Nut gave birth to the sun that gave birth to life on earth. Let's talk science. What happened is that air raised the carbon level higher up so that oxygen could come down to earth and give life. That's the same thing that we teach. This comes in a metaphoric story. I've seen this written in planetary science books. The same way I told you about air and carbon dioxide and all that is taught, you could teach this here the same way. It's the same exact story. The difference is, is that this is about 7,000 years older. And it's correct. When you look at this material and you understand what's happening, then you don't have a problem. Because look at the process. Look at what they're saying. Let's take the concept of Nun, Pata, and Atum, and let's bring it down here on Earth. And let's look at the work of John G. Jackson and what John G. Jackson is saying. Because John G. Jackson says that this solar system was once a molten gaseous nebula. This nebula was rotating at enormous speeds. As the mass cooled down, it also contracted and developed greater speed. You're dealing with the law of opposites, the law of polarity. Within this, there's another key. Because remember, you have matter and energy, nun pata. Atum comes as consciousness and names four pair, or eight. 
but there are nine planets. There aren't nine planets. There are eight planets. Pluto is a moon to Neptune, and the Africans knew it. How could they see out that far? You know, we still think Pluto is a planet. Pluto is no longer the furthest planet from the sun now, you know. Neptune is, because Pluto now has turned around into, into Neptune's other atmosphere. And now Neptune is the furthest planet out, and Pluto is number eight. But Pluto is not a planet. And Western civilization thought it was a planet for years. Pluto's too small. Just the size of the four outer planets alone tells you that. The four inner planets are a certain size. You have Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Then you have these huge planets, Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, Saturn. And then you have this little teeny thing out there next to Neptune. And they tell you it's a planet. By the nature of its size, it couldn't be a planet. But that's not the point. How did the Chemites know this? If they didn't know all this, how could they have known this? How could they have known this? Because they had everything necessary to do it. There's no question that they had what was necessary. You see, we're in a fog. We believe what they have taught us. We believe that what they say is true, and we don't open ourselves to a much greater horizon. They've kept a wool over us. You know, it's like someone putting you into a room, and you thinking that's all there is in life, until they open up that door and show you the world. It is so key that we know this. The ancient Chemites were so brilliant. And as I begin to look at the work that they've done, you begin to see exactly how brilliant they are. But the only thing is, is that I, t I think that they were around far longer than we think. I also think that the Sphinx is at least 10,000 years old. And, I, and I'm sure that the Sphinx is a woman. It is not a man. Just by the structure of its face, it's not a man. Just looking at it is not a man. And looking at when it was built, you would have had to have seen it was built during the times of matrilineal. But we don't know this because we still have people like Patrick Daniel Moynihan attempting to intimidate us, to make us feel a certain way. I was going to say something, but I'll leave it alone. Because of time, and because people are beginning to compare me to, in my time anyway, to Steve Coakley, I, I think I'm getting a hint here somewhere. I understand that he turned the lights out in New Jersey he stayed so long. But I think the one thing that Steve Coakley and I have in common is that we're trying to take billions of years and trying to do it in our lifetime, and it's not going to happen. Because I came with so much to talk to you about, but there's so little time to really develop the things that we'd like to do. But I knew that I did have the time to at least begin some concepts with you, to begin to look at some of the things that our ancestors were doing, because clearly they knew what was going on. And if I may give you another example, I want to talk about the hymn to our ten for a while, because that was another question I had for our brother, Dr. Theophilio Benga. Because in the hymn to our ten, this is what it says. You make the seed develop in women, you create the semen of men. You have the son slash daughter in the bosom of his, her mother. Your rays are on the earth. The sun is far, but it remains near. What we're saying here, and I said to Dr. Obenga, I said in the hymn to our ten, the priests and the priestesses are saying that the sun is the reason why the plants are green. And I said, if they knew that the sun made the plants green, could they have known about melanin that made humans black? And he thought about it, and he gave an answer. There was a brother sitting in the left-hand corner that wanted to move him a little bit further, and I'm so glad he did, because I was going to let it go. He said, but... What Brother Coleman asked you was, could they have known about melanin since they knew about green? If you know plants are green by the sun and you look at yourself, then do you know about melanin? He said, 
that there are parts of the hymn to our ten, and he went down and he read it. He said, not only did they know that, it's, that in the hymn to our ten that the sun was the reason why plants were green, but that they also said that the sun, ye the mighty force in the sky, are the reasons why the languages of the worlds are divided and the complexions of humans are different. Now, they might not have used the word melanin because that's not an African word as we know it. But if they knew that the sun made people's complexions different, they would have to know the impact that made it different. So they may not have called it melanin, but they knew what made them black. And that's written in the hymn to our ten. This is key psychology. This is key biology because they knew it back then and they wrote about it back then. So obviously they were doing a lot of science work. There's a lot of different medical papyri that talks about operations that they were doing on people's necks, on heads, eye surgery. All of this was here in ancient Kemet. All of this was taught in the text that we should teach our children. Teach them that because they can learn it and they can excel. And then finally, the law of polarity. Let me take you through an exercise. Because of the way in which we are here, I cannot write on the board. I'm very much in the visual. But if you have a sheet of paper and you would like to work this out with me, I ask you to draw a square. In the right-hand corner, in the right-hand corner of your square, please put the letter A. Draw a square, and in the right-hand corner, put the letter A. At the top, the top right-hand corner of your square, put an A, right in that angle. Inside your square, please draw a diamond so that within your square, the diamond will touch each corner of your square. In the top of the diamond, please put the letter B. B as in Booker. I'm talking about always relating things that are related. As you look your left hand corner of your square, put C. Top. Top of the square, left hand side, put C. In the inside of the square, because we're going to write things on the outside. Underneath that in the diamond, put D. Diamond, left hand, yeah, left hand side of the diamond, put a D. Say again? No, right in, right in the diamond, the, the left side of the diamond. When you get down to the left lower square, put E. Then in the lower diamond, put F. Bottom of the diamond, put F. And then in the right hand, I'm sorry, right hand side of the square, put G. And then finally ended in the diamond with an H. Now, Everything that you need to know, and this is what I tell young people, everything you need to know in life is right on that piece of paper there. There is nothing that exists in our universe that's not going to be on that square when we're finished. One of the most important things in education, the object of education is to make things simpler. 
not more difficult. And the best teacher, like Malcolm, is someone who can take a complex issue and make it very clear. In A, the Chemites said that there are four elements on our earth. Fire, A, put fire by A. C, air. E, water. G, earth. They said that every element has a characteristic. And they said that both fire and air can be hot. But by the law of polarity, if B is hot, F, which is opposite B, must be cold. They then went over and looked at air and water. And they wondered, what can both air and water be? Wet. And by the law of polarity, that would be D. D is wet. By the law of polarity, if D is wet, you know that H is, and that is what both fire and earth can be. But they said this law of polarity is much too important to end it there. Because I think we can get some colors in here. Let's start with the primary colors. They said, let's make fire red. A is red. You know, when I first saw this in Stolen Legacy, I didn't understand this. When I began to look at it at a different point, then I understood it quite frankly. They said that air will be yellow, water will be blue, and guess what? No such thing as black on the spectrum. It's indigo, blue-black, because in the spectrum, things don't get black. Black is invented. It's the rainbow we're dealing with here. I'm sorry? Indigo, I'm sorry, indigo is G, with earth. Now we're teaching our children primary colors and secondary colors, all of a sudden we're having all these problems, put it on a square. Because when you, between fire and air, red and yellow becomes orange. B is orange. When you mix yellow and blue, you know that D is Green. Mm-hmm. When they said, they looked at blue and they looked at indigo and they said, so nice, gonna do it twice. So F, indigo repeats itself because on the rainbow, as it begins, so too does it end. After blue, at F is indigo. And remember, Earth is also indigo. And indigo finds itself on the color spectrum twice. But what color do you get when you mix red and indigo? Purple. The first color you get in the rainbow is red. The, color, the last color of the rainbow is purple. Enough? No. They say you can get something else. They said there are four atoms on our Earth. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. Four major, main, irreducible atoms. Fire, carbon. Air, oxygen. Water, hydrogen. Earth, nitrogen. I'm sorry, try it again. Fire is carbon. There are four atoms, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen. The fire at A, carbon. C, oxygen. E, hydrogen. 
G nitrogen. Let's go back to John G. Jackson's work and look at the law of polarity. And please, I would like to read this because I, 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 I don't particularly like to read, but there are times when I think it's very important because I don't want to get certain information wrong. Check this out. He's talking about life on Earth and what brought it into being. This life must have originated when the Earth developed a temperature that was neither too hot nor too cold. Of the hundred odd elements, 109 to be exact, of the, hundred and, of the 109 elements which the stuff of the universe is composed, only a very few show an affinity for life. Living matter consists mainly of atoms which possess the property of forming large molecules. Atoms of hydrogen may combine to form molecules of hydrogen, H2, H3. Or atoms of hydrogen and oxygen can combine to form molecules of water. Two parts hydrogen, one parts oxygen, H2O. H2O2, hydrogen peroxide. But none of these compounds, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, none of these compounds has more than four atoms per molecule. The nitrogen compound behaves in a similar manner. But if to the atoms of hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, we add the carbon atoms, a most extraordinary thing happens. The atoms of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon combine to form the molecules consisting of the hundreds and thousands of molecules of our Earth. Carbon is the mothership of life. It is of prime importance to the chemistry of life because life first arose in the warm primeval ocean of Nun. Think about it now, we're on Earth now. We're not in the universe with this Nun. We got a new Nun on Earth. And in this Earth, 300 million years ago, there was only one huge continent on Earth and Western civilization calls it Pangea. The African land mass, the African land mass was the original center land mass around which all the other continents were attached. And just as Patar rose out of Nun, so too did the primeval waters of Nun bring forward the African continent. Africans knew geology. Pangea is a Greek word. They, the Greeks got Pangea from Pata. And that when the ancient Chemites was telling the story of Nun Pata and Atum, they saw that it replicated itself not just in the universe, not just in the solar system, not just on earth, but in life. Because did not our consciousness rise up out of us as all others did? The consciousness is what you're after. It's not that humans are important. It's that humans were the divine choice to become conscious. And we're losing that point because we are forgetting that there have been over five different human forms on earth. And each one died out because of one thing, their inability to survive in their surroundings. Black folk, we got to know how to survive in our surroundings. <laughs> this information is real. It is in our classrooms. And we can teach this. Just like we teach Pangea, we can teach Pata. It is so important that we begin to develop the different things that we need. But now let's wrap this up, because I could go on. I mean, we'd be here for hours, you know, so let me just. Oh, boy. Nun. Nun is eternal matter, the waters of life. Ma'at is the path on which order and arrangement exists. Tehuti is Ma'at's mate. 
He is the knowledge that allows us to stay on her path. Pata is eternal energy, the life in the waters, once dormant, sleep, even comatose. Pata, the creator who fashions and cracks open the cosmic egg of the universe on a potter's wheel of universal eternity. Atum is the balance of matter and energy, the one from two which equals harmony, which created Kepra Septepi, or the coming into being for the first time. Creative engagement within the continuing process of becoming for everything and all is part of the process. So, Tehuti and Hatshepsut. Tehuti says, somebody's got to turn on the light. Everything we need to see is in this room. Unfortunately, 500 years ago, somebody turned out the light. Hatshepsut says, what is the light teacher? Tehuti responds, it is not what is the light, it is not who is the light, light is the process of becoming, light is coquette. Hatshepsut says, how can we find the light teacher? Tehuti says, you must turn it on. Hatshepsut, but where is the switch? Tehuti, it is in your mind. The switch is your thoughts, turn them on and you will see everything and all because 500 years ago, somebody turned out the lights. The first moment of creation, Kepra Septepi, created the process of becoming, and this eternal process orders and arranges all and everything. From within the mighty waters of Nun came what we know as today, the superclusters, the clusters, the galaxies, star systems, planets, earths, animals, plants. Everything and all going through the process of order and arrangement. The earth was once part of the sun. Once the earth was born through solar power. It began to exist through the light and heat energy that emanated from this mighty star. Solar power orders and arranges life on earth by constituting and is Kepra Septepi. Our purpose on earth is to in the same as the creator God, benevol benevolent and peaceful. It is our task to return everything and all to the creator in better condition than when he, she gave it to us. That is our charge. And that the spirit that is God could not manifest itself to see itself by itself. So she, he created a process by which they could become conscious of their consciousness. They call this process Kepra Septepi. With this consciousness, they would be able to see for herself, for himself, him, herself. This process started unnumberable, immeasurable quantities of eons ago. However long the process, it continues. Processing the master plan, however long the master plan, it continued, planning a masterpiece. This masterpiece was to be the perfect balance of complementary polarities. Polarities when in harmony vibrate the very process of God. The power to ray or recreate him, herself. This ray creation by the nature of the very law of life through heat had to be black though not seen by the naked eye. It was the color of the outer encasement of the masterpiece, the African man and woman, known today as the original human being. By the nature of life and through its process of becoming, Africa was the birthplace of humanity. To be born, nurtured, sustained, and above all, civilized, humanity had to have had dark pigmentation tightly curled hair, very thick lips, and wide nose. All the phenotypical characteristics that help civilization be born in inner Africa. It was brought north, south, east, and west after they got the job done right in inner Africa. This happened millions of years ago, 
and millions of years later, in other land masses and islands, Africans went, changed pigmentation. This now comprises our planet Earth. So what we're looking at and what we're attempting to do is to recreate, restructure, and restore African knowledge and dignity. And to do this, to do this, I would like to end with again our brother Bob Marley when he says, through the mystics of tomorrow, have no fear or sorrow. The fight against the Rasta man is a world of confusion. It's a world of confusion in order to force the devil's illusion. But the very stone that their builder refused shall be our head cornerstone because we've got something they can never take away. And that's the fire that's burning down everything. It's burning down everything and we must feel the fire because only the birds have their wings. This is no time to be deceived. Won't you help to sing our redemption song? Because we refuse to be what they wanted us to be. We are what we are, and that's the way it's going to be. Because if you don't know, you can't educate us for no equal opportunity. Because we're talking about my freedom, our people's freedom and liberty. Shemem Hotep, my brothers and sisters. Amun is satisfied. Professor Booker T. Coleman. <laughs> Professor Booker T. Coleman. Professor Coleman, thank you very much. Let's hold hands. Everybody is getting ready to run out of here. Turn around. We don't have nowhere to go. Most of us are unemployed. No need to run out of here. I know I don't have anywhere to go. <laughs> Repeat after me. We are the African people. Robbed from our homeland. Robbed of our names. Our languages. Our culture. Our religion. And our self-respect. But we shall rise. Never to fall again. Up, ye mighty race, we can accomplish what we will. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No peace. Hug everybody, tell them you'll see them next week, starting at 6 o'clock, Emily Bend.